Good day, mates. Okay, so I'm never doing an Umbra Australian accent ever again. Agreed. Hey guys, it's Muller Making Time, and today we're looking at an Australian aircraft, the CAC Boomerang. As usual, we're going to be looking at the history of the aircraft itself, alongside looking at where you can fly this in video games. Then we'll be looking at the model, the construction, the history, and well, what we've made. So let's get into it. The aircraft company behind the boomerang was the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation. This was a formation of three companies that had merged in 1936. The goal was to be self-sufficient so that Australia could stand on its own producing aircraft. One of the most well-known products of the CAC was the Wirraway. This was a license-built T6, uh, which is a training aircraft. However, the Australian version did have um, sort of a rear gun emplacement, so it could shoot targets from the rear and also could perform light bombing duties. Interestingly, the CAC Wirraway was the first aircraft to play the kill in the Second World War for the Royal Australian Air Force. We'll hear more about the Wirraway as this goes on. Other aircraft that the CAC would become known for would include the Beaufort, which was a development of the Bristol Blenheim platform. Obviously the most well-known I'd say, or the most well-known sort of later model would be the Bowfighter rather than the Beaufort. The Beaufort has become synonymous with sort of Australia in that theatre of war in the Pacific. Whereas I guess in Europe we sort of more know, so know the Blenheim and the Bowfighter. There were some other variations of that aircraft too, but we won't go into those today. There were growing concerns in Australia that perhaps as the war developed or grew on or got more intense, there wouldn't be the capability for, say, the United Kingdom or the United States to supply sort of Australia with aircraft. And that started becoming reality. So in 1941, the head of the CAC sort of thought, hey, maybe we should start looking at building an indigenous aircraft. At the time, the CAC was headed up by Lawrence Blackett, and to be honest, this idea was not taken too fondly. There was a growing concern that seemed to be that Australia wouldn't even be able to produce a uh, license-built fighter, let alone develop their own indigenous fighter. So, yeah, well, the tide was really against Wackett, really. This isn't stop Wackett. Wackett actually recruited Fred David. Fred David was an Austrian Jew, so obviously they fled from Europe in order to seek safety. They'd worked for both Heinkel and for Mitsubishi, so they had really unique experience on the Heinkel HG112, which was a VF109 capacitor, and for the famous A6M0. So really, they had a lot of pedigree to work from. By 1942, the industries of the United Kingdom were struggling to supply Australia with the fighters they so greatly needed. It was at this point it became apparent that the boomerang was needed. Pressing on with development, it would only be three months after the prototype's initial flight on the 29th of May 1942, or sort of the initial existence of the prototype anyway, when the Royal Australian Air Force would say, yes, proceed with this. Barely a couple of months later, on the 15th of July 1942, the Royal Australian Air Force took delivery of its first CAC boomerang. Now, we mentioned the rear away earlier and that it was going to come into more of a conversation, and it is. The CAC boomerang was developed to take as many elements of both the Beaufort and the Wear Away to make sure that it was the easiest fighter they could build with the existing equipment they had, taking away a lot of the difficulties that developing tooling and unique mechanics for, you know, a new aircraft. This can be seen in the aircraft quite clearly. The undercarriage, for example, directly comes from the Wear Away. You can see a lot of similarities in the wings as well. The overall shape of the boomerang was partly dictated buy the equipment they had available and it's an accomplishment. The boomerang is an incredible feat of engineering and compromise. And to be honest it looks kind of cute I'll be honest, I really think it's a lovely little aircraft. The CSE boomerang would go on to serve in sort of air patrol duties but not really getting into any engagements. The main purpose of the boomerang would end up being as a ground strike aircraft and it was relatively successful in this role and it's what we became known for. As the war would go on, however, the boomerang would show its limitations, and other aircraft could perhaps perform its duties better. What's incredible though is 250 aircraft were still produced during the course of the war, and it served between 1943 and 1945. Prior to that, obviously, it had some training capabilities in sort of the mid to late 1942s, but not with an operational squadron. Both the Wirray and the boomerang showed the resourcefulness of Australians and embodied the spirit of Australia. 
Today there are several boomerangs still flying and I think a few wearaways or at least a wearaway too. I actually saw a boomerang flying in 2016 at Florence in Belgium. This was at the Belgium Air Force days where I went with my father. It was the first international air show we've been to and when I saw the boomerang was on the program I looked in the model shop, or model tent as it was, and lo and behold they had an airfix boomerang so I grabbed it. And that's the one we're actually going to go on to build. But before that, let's have a look at the boomerang in gaming. We're going to talk about numerous places where you can play the boomerang today. However, the first one I don't have any footage for, which is Microsoft Combat Flight Simulator 3. Hey, editing me here. So I did get footage of this in the end uh, because I literally went on a quest to find it in Combat Flight Simulator 3. So I spent ages looking for the boomerang. There was one by Airplane Heaven um, and I just find that on eBay for like a tenner, but I didn't want to spend money on it to show show either freeways or ways that you could get it in a game organically. And then I found out that one of the expansion packs for Flight Simulator, one a fan made one called PTO, um, Rising Sun had the boomerang included and it took me an absolute age to find all the links so I've linked them all in the description below uh, but it comes with an absolute ton of aircraft. Combat Play Simulator 3 can still be an absolutely incredible game so yeah have a look at that and we'll, uh, we'll have a look at the footage as well. <laughs> so as you've just heard a bit of a quest to get this working and my god do I enjoy the fact that I've got this now. <laughs> So you can see the boomerang there and it's uh, a lot higher res than the default models because a lot of the later Compact Flight Simulator 3 models are actually way higher uh, resolution than the original ones. But I think they hold up quite well today. Uh, the game obviously has aged. It is, I think, technically just classed as abandoned wear at this point so you can buy it from any source. Um, and I assume that would mean the add-ons are in a similar position, but I wouldn't want to say for certain Either way, the one I'm flying today is a freeware one from a PTO, Rising Sun. Uh, again, that was part of the struggle of finding this. And I'm flying it in the original Combat Flight Simulator 3. Um, I couldn't get the actual expansion to work on its own. However, it works. It's a really good representation of the boomerang. Uh, Combat Flight Simulator is still a good simulator by all standards. It's nowhere near as bad as people would perhaps think, considering the age of it. Obviously, you can see, you know, graphic-wise, it's not it's not World Thunder, it's not Flight Simulator, it's not DCS. But you know what? It's it's not half bad, and the boomerang is a niche aircraft. You're not going to get it in a lot of places, and so that's why I thought it was so important for me to find this historic piece of aviation gaming and uh, share it with you guys. So yeah, if you are looking for a free way to fly the boomerang, uh, Combat Flight Simulator 3, abandoned wear, completely free for you to get at this point. Don't fly it with the joystick, fly it with, uh, sorry, don't fly it with a keyboard even, fly it with the joystick only and honestly, you'll have a really, really good time. The Combat Flight Simulator series was one of the first and biggest Combat Flight Simulators uh, sort of available and was developed by Microsoft alongside their flight simulator platform. Indeed a lot of aircraft would have crossover so you could fly one aircraft in flight simulator without weapons and then in combat flight simulator with weapons. This would sort of diverge as the series went on and unfortunately combat flight simulator 3 was the last. Moving on from that though we do have Microsoft Flight Simulator X or FSX as it's affectionately known. There is a boomerang that you can fly in flight simulator and it looks pretty well modelled. I wouldn't say it's the highest quality model of all, and it definitely shows its age, probably being developed in the mid to, to sort of earlier part of the flight simulator's existence. You can convert a lot of these aircraft over to the newest flight simulator, Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, but it is a bit of a time consuming process, and also you might not have the full functionality, but if you can do it, I fully recommend you give it a try. It's not something I've personally tried to do before, and I'm a bit scared of doing it, and time consuming <laughs> so I haven't but it may mean that this is also available in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. Given the unique characteristics of this aircraft and the fact that it's just a lovely plane to fly, if you want to fly in a really peaceful environment this may be the place to do it. 
Moving on to what we've mentioned already in the PZLP11 video, we've got ILZU 1946, which is probably the most cost-effective way to fly the boomerang. This is a third-party uh, free download that you can find for the CAC boomerang to fly it in 1946. ILZU 1946, as we mentioned before, can be upgraded with lots of mods and uh, custom graphics packs to make it seem like a much more modern game than it actually is. Also, quite often being on sale for between two to five euros or pounds, it's definitely the cheapest one on this list today, other than the CFS3, which almost is sort of abandonware at this point. Again, ILT 946, really good option to fly this aircraft. And because you can set custom scenarios, even if you just want to fly it around and just do it quite peacefully, or you want to do it multiplayer and just fly around with your friends, those should be options that you're able to accomplish. Moving on from this, we've got Birds of Steel. Birds of Steel is famous for being the platform of which Brawl Thunder was built upon, which we'll go on to later. Birds of Steel was a big game when you took control of aircraft of World War II and pitted them against other aircraft in a not quite arcadey but not quite realistic setting. It was a really unique style at the time. The game has sort of faded into obscurity at this point and the only footage I could find is not fantastic, but this is the <laughs> ones I could find online. I did not know really anything about this game. It was a game I nearly bought back when I had a PS3, but I couldn't afford it. And I think I remember being in the shop and having to choose between Skyrim or Birds of Steel, and I chose Skyrim, and I don't really regret that decision. Anyone who wants to play this now, though, can do it on the next game we're looking at, War Thunder. War Thunder had two boomerangs originally. However, the second boomerang has now been removed, which was the later variant of the boomerang. You can still get the first one, though, and I had an absolute blast doing it. In fact, I had so much fun buying the boomerang, I've made a cinematic video, which I'll be releasing on Thursday. This is something I might be doing going forward, but let me know what you think. War Thunder, as I said, had two variants, but the second variant was removed last November. You can now only buy the first version of the boomerang. It packs an absolute punch with its machine gun and cannons, and well, if you use it effectively, you can absolutely dominate the skies. It's not a high altitude fighter and prefers to being at mid to low altitudes and can outturn almost anything. Get into a dogfight with someone and you can sit on their tail quite happily until they're gone. That's it for video games today. Let's have a look at the model kit itself. So the CAC Boomerang model we're building today is from Airfix and originally came out in 1965. Since then it's had a lot of boxings and most recently for 2022 is being re-released as a vintage classic. Vintage classics are their old toolings, just reboxed and remade today. There's no new tooling parts to them, and it's just like they were when they originally came out, or more accurately, sort of as they came out at their best points. <laughs> the artwork of the vintage classics versions is absolutely gorgeous, and to be honest, it's the best version of the artwork you're gonna get. So I highly recommend, if you haven't got it yet, get the vintage classics version. It's definitely the best one to get. From what I can see, over time, the kit hasn't really changed at all. There's been some third-party boxings that have added some new parts, and obviously you can buy some detailing kits, but this is pretty much the main or standard boxing of the boomerang you can find. There are some resin versions, and I think there was one by Tasman that you could get, but it's not really easy to get hold of. The FX version has still always been quite easy to get hold of, even though it hasn't been in print for quite some time. The last time the boomerang was released was in 1998, and that's quite some time ago. It had that horrible boxing where it had the weird orange and they decided, hey, we're not gonna have that gorgeous artwork anymore. We're gonna have this weird bright orange color, which I didn't even think fit in in the 90s. So I don't really know what they were going for. Either way, that's what they used. And that's the boxing I have today. It's the same as the 2020 release, so I don't really feel too bad about it. And yeah, I bought this one, as I say, in Florence in 2016 when I saw a live aircraft fly. So I just realised I filmed most of this video with paint on my hand. Never mind. <laughs> From what I've seen, the boomerang kit, or most of the vintage classic kits that have been re-raised for 2020, seem to go for between six to ten pounds. I think it's pretty much six to, to about twelve euros, from what I can see in different websites. Or, you know, the regional equivalency you may have. They're really good value for money, and although they like detail, you can always add some stuff in, either from your kits box or from some scratch building. It's worth noting that the boomerang has pretty much no cockpit, featuring that standard sort of just seat that most older kits from the 60s have. Well, if you've made it this far, thank you so much. Obviously, feel free to subscribe. It really does help me out, and hit that notification bell if you can do. It'll make sure you see every single new video and live video. 
I tend to release videos at 7.30 on most Mondays and also stream on most Sundays at 4.30. As I said previously as well, there will be some more Thunder videos going on too, so we'll see how they go and how much they destroy my channel and the algorithm. Anyway, let's have a look inside the box. Boom, there we go, it's the CAC Boomerang. And this aircraft is lovely and it build the dream. I, I hate this boxing so much, it just makes me so sad they got rid of the artwork. But hey, let's at least have a look inside the box. And we'll start with the decals, I think. That's the most important thing for us to have a look at. Decals look lovely. Again, considering their age, this is a 90s boxing and they look pretty good. You can see everything's already cut out. Something I really like about um, sort of most mainstream um, F, 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 aircraft manufacturers or aircraft model manufacturers is how well done the decals are. Um, there's only a few brands where I really despise the decals, but Airfix is always one that's, I think, always nailed it. And the, the colours look really, really vibrant. Plus, you don't have to stick the white on separately, which is always a bonus, in my opinion. <laughs> but yeah, they, they look pretty, pretty damn good. Now, the instructions, on the other hand, they're, they're very old, they have FX, they don't look great. Um, it gives you a lot of info on the front, which is nice, but then this is this is the first bit. It's just, I don't get why they didn't divide it into subsections. Um, this could have been a couple of steps, but this was really just how model kits were at the time. But that's it, two pages. That's, that's the entire instructions for this aircraft. It is remarkable how simple this is. This really is a beginner's kit. And you know what, it's not bad. I hate that this is all in grayscale. Um, I don't understand why it's all in grayscale, but it is. And that was just, again, another thing at the time. Um, I still don't get why most manufacturers haven't moved to digital instructions. It's something that really, really baffles me. Um, because now we're just printing in colour instead, when really, I think it should just all be digital to save a lot of paper at this point too. So looking at the wings, and the wings look really nice. The detail's pretty good. Cause again, considering the age, there's raised texture marks for sort of each panel of the um, where the fabric's stretched over the top of it. Your little engravings for sort of moving surfaces and then the top side's pretty much the same uh, to be perfectly honest but it looks nice and um, I'm scratching it there to feel the texture of it. I'm really quite impressive how nice it looks. Again the size of the aircraft or the, or the fuselage have a similar pattern Um the detailing's not bad but not great. The clear parts came on this massive sprue for some god knows reason. I also got a Focke Wolf canopy, a 190, I think, included. I'd probably give these 6 out of 10, like they're perfectly fine, but you can tell there's some sort of opacity to them. Um, I don't know how to explain it, like it's almost like it blurs vision a little bit and it's not like a lot of cockpit, cockpits do where they sort of bend the light a bit. This has some sort of opacity to it, so that's why I'm giving it a 6. The rest of the sprues, I mean, I hate that FX used to do the sprues like this. But we can have a look at the, the pilot, who I don't use, because I don't love putting pilots in. I know some of you request it. I've done it in some future ones. I'm not going to do it in all of them. But yeah, there's, there's a little pilot, the 90s pilot, or the 60s pilot, I should say. That's when he was originally moulded. He's never going to get to fly though, I'm afraid. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but yeah, so this is the other sprue, uh, the only sprue in the box. Um, it's it's fine, but I just I hate the sprue type, and I hope this never returns with any manufacturer because it is awful and not very secure either for transport. So you can see all parts together now, and uh, yeah, this is a really basic kit. It's really a beginner's kit, a proper beginner's kit. So it's really not bad. Now we've had a look inside the box, it's time to get onto the construction of this aircraft and I will point out one flaw before we even go into it because I've already finished the actual aircraft and so I wanted to point this out straight away and there's like, I'm assuming a sort of like an AIS like or some sort of pitted tube that goes into the very far right of the right wing aircraft and uh, yeah I, I put that way too far in and it wasn't until I was flying it in War Thunder that I realised it should be way further out the instructions weren't massively clear and that's sort of what led to the issue so just yeah something to remember <laughs> oh and also we're, we're doing this in a paint scheme that would be for a much later boomerang 
purely because that's on the box art for the um, sort of the re-release of this aircraft and it means I didn't need to use all of the decals and it probably isn't exactly perfect historically but I really love what I end up with so that's what we're doing. <laughs> Let's get into the building. Well, 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 are we ready to put probably the quickest construction we've ever had on this channel? That is going to be the CAC Boomerang. It is incredibly quick to make this kit. I started off by chopping out a few of the parts, putting the engine and the cowling together, and uh, sticking the uh, the seat into the cockpit area, which is all the cockpit detailing you get in this kit, so buy some extra details if you think you need anything else scrap, build something. Now, for the actual engine, you're meant to be able to rotate the prop. It comes with like a, a bit you put through the engine. It has a stopper on one end and you glue the prop onto the other. Um, I, however, lost this. I was using my tweezers and it flicked off into the ether and has never been seen since. So my prop does not spin, but that's absolutely fine. I did sort of glue mine on offset so it didn't look, I don't know, too pristine, I guess. Funny, because I don't under a wire kit very much. <laughs> now I stuck the fuselage together and it was really easy. Everything fit really well. The wings went on next, and again, I was kind of shook how well they fit and how few gaps there were. You could really see the wear away resemblance starting to come in as well. I think the wings really, really do show sort of the resemblance to wear away the most, to be perfectly honest. You add on the tail section next, and the tail I thought went together quite well. It wasn't really hard, but um, because again, sometimes they sort of droop a little bit, but these ones seem pretty, pretty decent for what they are. And that was pretty much it. Other than that, it's the landing gear to go. And obviously there is a section underneath. And um, because I didn't know what it was, but I put it on anyway, thinking this is probably needed. There is um, sort of a pod, you can see it on the instructions there, that goes onto the underside of the wing. And I didn't really know what it was. And it turns out it's an underbelly uh, fuel tank. So now you know what it is. Uh, I think the shaping of the Airfix one may be, I don't know, not a million percent accurate. A lot of the drawings I've seen have a slightly different shape or they look a bit sort of deeper. Um, but it, it's something I thought I'd add on because I thought, well, it's in the instructions and I'm not really sure which versions had or hadn't had them. There's not super load of detail online about it, but there are a few books that have detail in. Um, so I... Well, if I'd, I'd been sensible, I would have read them before I started making this project, but money is a thing, so <laughs> I did what I could with the research I could find online. <laughs> now, the, uh, the, 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 the undercarriage was actually quite simple and uh, works pretty effectively. Again, undercarriage is a massive bugbear of mine. If you're going to make a kit, it needs to be able to stand really, really well. I'd rather it have less detail and stand well than have loads of detail and be kind of really rubbish landing gear because models are meant to sit there and look lovely and make you smile when you walk past them and if it's got a constantly collapsing undergear that's or undercarriage it's it's not going to happen is it so that's really a, a bugbear of mine you can see me putting in some filler and this is just in the bigger gaps really i thought i used some sprue goo but maybe i didn't use it oh no there we go <laughs> i did use some sprue goo on there the sprue goo is basically a combination of some glue that I have left over and some sprues. You put the sprues in there and melt them down and it becomes like a sprue goo. Um, and you can use it to fill in sections and it bonds the plastic really nicely as well. On to the painting of this kit then and I chose to do the white tail because that was on the Vintage Classics box. I've seen a few different versions of the white tail. Some of them just have a sort of a band around the fuselage and then it's white further back. I saw one where it had sort of a step in it, and that's the one I decided to go for. Again, I'm not a million percent sure whether it's 100% historically accurate, but that's the one we ended up going with. The paints I've used is a slight mix. I used sort of a, an earthy brown, and then I used a slightly lighter brown because I felt like the colour was just slightly off. The actual um, uh, primer that I used was just Humbrol Grey, so nothing too bad. And on tail section, I used um, the correct white to get the whiter section. So that's all I did on this. I don't think it really shows very well um, in the actual um, sort of video, but that's that's sort of how we got the really nice white on there. The green I'm using is just a drab olive grey, uh, olive grey, olive green, and that's going to cover sort of these sections, which I've not done the brown in. The brown did need a couple of coats, um, and you can see I've got the little the two 
spots there, but I am using the custom mix still. I'm just going over it, making sure it looks really nice. The end of the side of the aircraft does have a sky colour, and it is literally just called Sky by Rebel. On hindsight, or in hindsight should I say, it probably should have been a more blue um, sky colour. I was probably a bit blind not realising that it should have been more blue. But I think it looks alright. It doesn't look massively off to me. Um, I think each each nation probably has a slight different variation on what Sky is. Um, and obviously different theatres so has different variations. And I think this is probably just too much on the sort of duckhead side of things rather than on the blue side of things. Now, because of how I did the painting, I managed to get a lot of the detail to show through, which is nice because this does have raised um, surfaces. It means it's probably a bit easier to keep the detail than sometimes when it's sort of engraved panel lines. Uh, but I think I got a nice texture to the model as well. The prop spinner I painted white too to match the back section, and again, this is just basing it. I pretty much used the vintage classics pops out, guys. I'm not going to lie for a lot of it as my reference point because the boxing I had, uh, I wasn't doing that one. And also uh, the instructions don't provide you with, you know, adequate detail. It's a black and white image. After that, it was a case of painting up the prop, which was done in a grey colour. Again, just using reference photos online. The cockpit as well, it's worth mentioning, is meant to have, from what I understand, is meant to go through where the back windows are. That should be completely transparent. Um, but that it's not in this, so I painted mine in sky, um, just again to give it some, I guess, vibrancy, some light, to give the idea that there is sky showing through it, but again, it's, I guess, up to your discretion of how you want to do that. There you go, I'm painting in that section there now. I've gone over the white just to give it a bit more of an extra oomph, and because I accidentally got some brown on it too. That was really all there was for the actual details of the, uh, model kit, or for the painting side of things. It was pretty much onto the details or the decals at that point. I did give it a satin varnish that you'll see shortly, uh, both before and after decaling, because fabric really doesn't give you a like 100% gloss sheen like metal does, but it does have a sheen to it, and that's why you know people use what's called the satin varnish or satin finish, because that gives it a really nice shine whilst also giving it a look of almost um, material, and it it looks really lovely. You'll see. The decals worked really well, considering their age again, um, God, they're nearly as old as me, which is very depressing. Um, the decals went on really well. You can see I added on the blue, um, sort of blue and, well, it's a blue and white decal onto the tail section. I was like, well, maybe I'll leave it on there, but then I realised well, it's not really historically accurate in any way, shape or form, and it looks kind of horrible. I also added on a blue stripe to the top of the white tail, which I noticed is what should be there, um, and again, like, Denote you know, sort of the RIAF colours that they used at the time, sort of Commonwealth colours, um, in that theatre, because I believe, if I remember correctly, the red was removed because of the resemblance to obviously the Japanese uh, and to Kmia. The other sections, or the numbers, uh, I had them crack on the left hand side of the aircraft and I had to sort of hit them all together manually. It's why you can see me moving off camera quite a lot because it was a lot of, oh my god, is this going to work sort of thing. So I did get it to work in the end and it looked. I think pretty damn nice. Um, I think I've probably put my uh, letters and um, sort of the serial on the wrong. It's probably a bit too far back potentially. Um, but you know what? It looks fine. There we go. There. That is the boomerang. And sorry, I keep looking over there. It's just sat on my windowsill on like the grass board I have, and it looks so so good. So, oh my gosh, I need to show you guys my CAC. Boomerang.
what do you think? <laughs> do you like it? Because I'm really proud of what I've done here. I think I did pretty good on the paint. Um, it's probably not the best, but the camo looks quite natural, quite realistic. I'm glad I got the satin varnish on. The decals look really good. They've sunk down to the aircraft absolutely perfectly. The sky colour I've got underneath looks fantastic. The white I got, the white isn't the best, but it, it definitely could have looked worse. Now, I know these little windows on the sides, they're meant to be sort of completely clear from what I could see. Um, there shouldn't be anything behind it, so I just painted them the sky colour because I thought that was the best way to do it. I didn't want to sort of cut it up in case I ruined the kit, so yeah, that's what I did. Also, I broke the prop so it doesn't spin, but I put it at an angle because I didn't want it to look, you know, like it was perfect, so that's why I got it at this little angle. But yeah, I haven't really weathered the aircraft because, I don't know, I thought I would do this as like one of the ones that we have now where it's like a living, breathing replica. And I just think it looks so pretty. I could add some weathering on if I was going to do it, I'd add some powder on here, but I don't know. I just, every time I got my inks out and my powders out to weather, I was like, I can't do it. I just can't. I think it looks so nice and pretty that I just, I don't want to do it. And normally I really enjoy doing the weathering process, but I just couldn't do it on this one. So what do we say to buy or fly? Now I'm going to say buy this aircraft. However, if you see a much older boxing of this, I would say fly. Now there's a reason for this before you get too panicked. The older boxings are going to have more risk of parts over being broken or the decals not actually being able to be usable anymore without a lot of work. So if you're a newer modeler or you're not a collector of older kits, just don't bother. <laughs> the price you're going to get the older kits for tends to be that of the new kits. So you're not really getting anything for it other than potentially some different markings because yes, the Zephraft has had a couple of different markings for it, but to be honest with the new boxing you get, if you're not super focused on historical accuracy, you can either paint with a white tail or without, it's not really gonna make any difference, or at least in my view. I think that's it. I, I really enjoyed this. I'm quite surprised. I, I feel really optimistic about that project that I suggested in the previous video. Well, I hope you have enjoyed this video, guys. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, the lighting conditions haven't really changed for the entire video, so hopefully the green screen's okay. Fingers crossed it is, because if it isn't, I'll cry. But yes, I, um, I've actually sorted things out a bit more now, so hopefully the lighting looks okay, and uh, everything looks good recorded. So we'll just have to see when it's all made. <laughs> Enjoy your morning, afternoon, evening, or night, wherever you are, and I'll see you in the next video. Also, I stand by Ukraine. Bye. Thanks for watching the video. I really appreciate it. Hit the subscribe button and notification bell to be notified of every new video on Mondays. You'll also be able to see me stream live on YouTube. Thanks again. I really appreciate it. Have fun modeling.